Good evening, Jenny. How are you? How's it going? Good, good. That's good to hear. Cardiovascular tonight, guys. Cardio. Oh, reading your. Oh, so you got you got you guys got your book. That's good. That is awesome. Mm hmm. It's very. It's very good. It's a good book. It kind of gets straight to the point, right? Yeah, straight to the point. It's a very good review. Yeah, Deborah is at the school. You can pick it up from the school. Tomorrow, if someone has the key, then yeah, you can go in there and get it. Mm hmm. It's there. Nope. Yep. I like it. Make sure that you guys read like infection control. Make sure you read because it kind of breaks down um, everything about standard precautions, airborne precautions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a good, you know, it's a good little resource for you guys. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to start. We're going to do um, cardiovascular lab values and EKG rhythms, okay? So um, the PowerPoint is in the, the chat. So you can always download the PowerPoint. And I always put it in the description box also. So you can always, um, you know, follow the PowerPoint, come back and listen to the lecture a little later. That way it'll kind of flow a lot smoother. All right. So let's begin, guys. All right. Let's get started. All right. So the first thing, guys, is always a disclaimer. So this is called fair use and is allowed for purposes of criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody, which doesn't infringe of copyright under 17 U.S.C. 107. Okay. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author and not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group of individuals. All right. So tonight, guys, will be the best night or while you're studying the anatomy of the heart. The best thing that I would recommend to do is go to Khan Academy and look at like a, you know, a five minute review of Khan Academy for the heart anatomy. That way, I want you to keep in mind when you're watching the video, you're a nurse and I want you to think of all the system disorders that come along with the anatomy of the heart. Since there's so many pieces, you know, so many different um, important structures of the heart. Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Okay, and Jenny, I'll send you a very good PowerPoint that has all the videos embedded. Okay, a very good PowerPoint. All right, so make sure that you always go and look at these sites like Khan Academy, osmosis.org, guys. Don't get so caught up in the pathophysiology or the anatomy and physiology, okay? Remember that you have to think, okay, the board wants me to be a, a safe first-year nurse. So what are the system disorders that come along with 
the heart. And there are quite a few. So this is like a four part series. There's so many cardiovascular disorders. So I don't want you to get so caught up and I don't want you to become a cardiologist. Okay. I want you to think, okay, what would a nurse have to know? What would a first year nurse have to know? Because that's what you're responsible for, a first year nurse. So the first thing is cardiac markers. This is going to be a huge deal for you guys. Cardiac markers. Okay. CKMB. All right. What happens in in troponin? All right. Um, Myoglobin. CBC. And what is kind of new, something that may, uh, something that's new to you is probably the fact that WBCs do increase with infectious processes. They do increase with inflammation of the heart. WBCs do increase with an MI. So that's very important. So if you do see a WBC lab question associated with an MI, yes, it does. It's true. The WBC does increase. And then, as you guys know about blood coagulation factors, you guys know that increase in factors can occur during an MI. Increase in factors can occur after an MI. And now this person is at risk. And I'm going to go back. This person is at risk for thrombophlebitis. Okay. So I'm going to, this slide is going to pop up. Okay. Make sure you remember that. Blood coagulation factors, guys. All right, that's our PT, PTT. Increase. An increase can occur during and after a myocardial infarction. So if someone has an MI, guys, you're looking for that lab value. Okay, the MI places the client at greater risk for thrombophlebitis. Okay, so we have to be very, very aware of our coagulation factors when someone comes in the facility with an MI. That's a huge deal. So you have to know about these cardiac markers. Okay. So CKMB. Okay. You're going to see them. Um, you're going to act. The physician is going to ask for this lab because it is a more sensitive. It is a more specific value for myocardial infarction. All right. It's more specific than um, the CK. It rises and falls after an MI. So you're definitely going to see the CKMB um, because it's just more specific. Um, It's more sensitive for myocardial infarction. So the physician will order that. And of course, they're going to order the troponin. So I put a little picture here for you. The troponin, all right? Troponin is a group of proteins that help regulate the contraction of the heart. So look at the troponin. So it's a group of proteins that help regulate the contraction of the heart. So if a patient is having a myocardial infarction, guys, the troponin level will rise. So I just want you to keep this in mind, okay? It's a group of proteins that help regulate the contraction of the heart. So if a patient is having a myocardial infarction, you can anticipate the lab values increasing. All right. So I put the T, um, troponin I and the troponin T there for you. All right. Now, troponin, high troponin levels indicate a problem with the heart. Okay. So this is why they go ahead and they pull that CKMB and they're going to pull a troponin to determine, okay, to, to have a definitive diagnosis. Okay. This patient is having a myocardial infarction. The lab values have increased. The cardiac markers have increased. All right. Another uh, important lab that the physician will order that you'll make sure that you read the value is the myoglobulin. So this will be in the urine. So I kind of had a picture here of the urine. It indicates action which damage muscle cell. All right. So this is also a lab value that they'll pull. Okay. And here's another visual for you. So um, myoglobin in the urine indicates actions which damage muscle cells. So they don't know, okay, this person does have myoglobin in the urine, then it is highly likely that this patient is having an MI. 
So this is a lab value that they're also, so it's like a list of lab values that they will pull to confirm that this patient is having a myocardial infarction. All right. Now, as nurses, guys, someone comes in, if you're in the ED or if you're on the floor, you're in a unit, you want to make sure that you're looking at a patient's lab values if a patient comes in with a myocardial infarction. And you'll notice that pretty much, you know, this is the CBC, okay? If you're working in the hospital, you're going to see the CBC pretty much on every patient. So you have to kind of know the parameters. But I want you to keep in mind that the WBC increases with infectious process, inflammation of the heart, myocardial infarction. So white blood cells will increase with inflammation of the heart. So don't forget that. All right. So also, as, as I mentioned earlier, guys, the PT time, the PT, the PTT or the APTT, whatever you get. Remember, the, co the co coagulation factors will increase. Uh, MI does um, put the patient at risk for a thrombo so just take a look. And it's you have to look at where the pin, there's a little pin mark, all right? Because this patient, no doubt, has varicose veins, no doubt. But this is the best image that I could find. So a myocardial infarction places client at greater risk for thrombophlebitis and extension of clots in the coronary artery. So we are looking at those coagulation factors because we know that our patient is at risk for thrombophlebitis, okay? We know that the, inc um, the coagulation factors will increase. So we are monitoring our patients. Okay, and of course, guys, we're going to check that PT and INR. Okay, if our patient has an MI, anticipate the PT, INR, the APTT um, being drawn for that patient. Okay, it's just something that's going to happen. And as a nurse, just, you know, be very aware of that. So, um, Coagulation, also known as clotting, is the process by which blood changes from a liquid to gel, forming a clot. So it's a process by, by which blood changes from liquid to gel, forming a clot. So remember, after a myocardial infarction, the patient is at risk for forming this clot, guys. So you want to make sure that you put um, look at the lab values. And if you do see PT, INR, APTT on your exams, you know that that's the lab value that they must, they will pull for a patient who has a myocardial infarct. CKMB, they're going to check for myoglobin and they're going to check the coagulation factors. All right, so this is another visual for you guys. So you will always remember that a MI does put a patient at risk for these, um, you know, DVT, thrombophlebitis. So we're checking that coagulation factors. All right. So this is kind of a breakdown of the types of coagulation tests, okay, that you can anticipate the doctor ordering. So they're going to do the pro thrombin time, which is the PT. It evaluates ability to clot. Some of our patients are clotting very fast, okay? Very fast. So that puts the patient at risk for developing a DVT. And the international normalized ratio ensures that results from a PT test are the same from one lab to another. So you'll see the PT INR with someone taking like warfarin or something like that, blood thinners. And the PTT determines if blood thinning therapy is effective. So you will see this with someone who's on heparin. Like if someone is on IV heparin, the doctor is going to order a lab every six hours to see, to determine if the blood is thinning effectively. Now, what does this have to do with the myocardial incident? Because remember, these coagulation tests or the lab values will increase. The patient is now at risk for developing a clot. So you want to always monitor these as a nurse. Okay. And if you're seeing this on your exit or your NCLEX, don't let it, you know, don't feel like, okay, this patient is having MI. Why am I doing the 
clotting factors. Yes, you absolutely will do the clotting factors. All right. Also, guys, believe it or not, they're going to check the total cholesterol levels. Okay. This, a, a patient has a high total cholesterol levels. If their cholesterol levels are through the roof, then okay, this patient is having chest pain. All the labs have increased and he has a high cholesterol level. Then yeah, he probably has some type of coronary artery disease. And yes, he's probably having an MI. All right. So remember, total cholesterol, they're going to always assess the, the cholesterol if someone is having a cardiovascular incident, okay? All right, so there's the good, there's the bad, and there's the ugly um, cholesterol, right? There's, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. So if this patient has a lifetime of ugly cholesterol, guys, then yes, he may ha be having... Um, a MI. This patient may be at risk for coronary artery disease. All right. So remember, the cholesterol levels will be assessed. So here you go. So what I would do, guys, because I've seen this on some exit exams in the past, and this is the question that you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss this guy. So what you need to do is you'll take this slide and you'll just write total cholesterol level, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides. Do that 10 times and just commit it to memory because you definitely don't want to miss this question. And, that, and let me tell you what I saw. I saw total cholesterol. They love to hit you with that total cholesterol and put it against that triglycerides. So this is just memorization. These little stickies should be in your bathroom by now. So you want to do these over and over, your lab values over and over and over, okay? Because I have seen total cholesterol levels on the exit exams. All right, so other diagnostic tests that they will um, assess in order to just give them a, a complete workup, a cardiac workup. They want to see how this patient is, is doing. Like, what's going on with this patient? Why is this patient having chest pain? All right. What type of lifestyle does this patient engage? OK, is this patient um, eating fatty foods or is there some type of um, maybe it's valves or cardiac valves or is it coronary artery disease? So all of these diagnostic tests and procedures, this is like a cardiac workup. This is what they call it. So, of course, they're going to assess a uh, risk of developing coronary artery disease. They're going to look at the lipids. They're going to, so you have to know those cholesterol levels. They're going to look at homocysteine. It's elevated. This lab value will be elevated if someone is having a cardiovascular incident. The high sensitive C-reactive protein, we hear this a lot for patients with autoimmune disorders, but they will, they may, um, you know, pull the lab because it does detect infl inflammation. And micro microalbumin in the urine. So if there's a small amount detected, then this may, uh, you know, kind of diagnose the patient with some type of coronary artery disorder. Remember, they're doing a cardiac workup. So all of this is included in the cardiac workup. All right. So, so here's some visuals for you guys. This is the coronary artery disease. Check out coronary arteries. So, of course, they're going to do lipid levels. Okay. Of course, they're going to do poor lipid levels because they want to see uh, maybe, you know, if, if this is going on in the patient's arteries. All right. They're going to definitely do um, lipid levels, serum lipids. All right. They need to know, okay, what's going on. And then remember the homocysteine lab? Well, when, and when it's elevated, high levels from eating meat. So they know, okay, high levels are linked to heart disease. So they're definitely go going to pull the homocysteine levels because they know high levels are linked to heart disease. This is that patient that has to eat these burgers or they sometimes they have like triple decker burgers. And so this is an indication. This is a cardiac workup uh, laboratory also, uh, lab value also. So remember, high levels are linked to heart disease. So this is why they'll, they'll pull the homocysteine. 
And of course, they're going to look for that albumin in the urine. Um, persistent means the kidney has some damage. Remember, they always, they're always going to link the cardiovascular system to the renal system. So they will, they will pull, pull some urine from the patient to determine if the patient has any type of kidney damage. All right. And then they're going to pull the high, highly sensitive C-reactive protein. Okay. And I know that you'll see this a lot with patients who have autoimmune disorders. They'll pull this lab, but C-reactive protein is used to, um, they'll determine if it's elevated. It, they can rule out cardiovascular diseases like coronary artery disease. So if it's elevated, they're saying that this patient is at risk for developing coronary artery disease. So they will pull the C-reactive um, protein. And I know we see it a lot for autoimmune disorders, but it does detect inflammation of the heart. So this is the reason why you may see it, because if it's elevated, the patient is at risk for developing coronary artery disease. All right. Now, we're going to talk about electrolytes, guys, because we can't talk about lipid levels, total cholesterol. We can't talk about troponin. We can't talk about microalbumin. We can't talk about any of that stuff without thinking about, man, is this patient having a cardiovascular incident because the electrolytes are in balance? Okay, because they're going to pull these labs also. They're going to pull the lipids. They're going to pull the troponins. Okay, um, they're going to look at all of these things, but they're going to also pull the electrolytes. Okay, remember uh, potassium and sodium, guys, they can have effects of, on the heart. You know that they can affect the heart. So hypokalemia causes increased cardiac electrical instability. Hypokalemia can cause ventricular dysrhythmias. And hypokalemia puts that patient that's taking digoxin, it puts them at risk for developing toxicity. Hypokalemia and digoxin don't mix. Remember those O's, hypokalemia and digoxin, okay? If a patient has hypokalemia, guys, and they are taking digoxin, they're going to develop digoxin toxicity, okay? They're going to start to present, all right? And hyperkalemia causes asystole, guys, hyperkalemia, and ventricular dysrhythmia, sodium levels, all right, decrease with the use of diuretics. So if someone is taking that ferrosamide, it may put the patient, uh, make the patient hyponatremic, and then calcium, all right? Hypocalcemia can cause ventricular dysrhythmias. Hypocalcemia can prolong ST and QT intervals. Hypocalcemia, guys, can lead to cardiac arrest. So look at the rhythms, guys. Some of these um, electrolyte imbalances can put a patient into a lethal rhythm. So this is one of the reasons why we have to look at these lab values and we have to know the lab values. So here you go. This is a, a lab value. You have to commit this to memory. So you, ne you never want to get these questions wrong, you know, just a lab value. All right. So make sure that you know the expected reference ranges for all of these values, because every one of these electrolytes can cause some type of um, disturbance for the heart. OK, so let's give you some examples. Let's give you some visuals, OK, of how devastating um, potassium, calcium, sodium could be. All right. So look at the a person who has a, a value of potassium within normal limits. All right. You see that beautiful, normal P wave. You have that normal PR interval. You have that beautiful, normal QRS. You have a rounded normal T size T wave and a U wave shallow if, pre if present. Well, if someone has hypokalemia, look at it. It has a slight, slightly peak wave, a slightly prolonged PR interval. It has a ST depression, shallow T wave prominent U wave. So you guys know that this is definitely going to affect the cardiac output because we need that 
normal P Q R S and then you need the T and then you need the U wave if it's present. So hypokalemia could put a patient at risk for decreased cardiac output. So just take a look at this. Uh, this is how, this is the electrical conduction of the heart. So we have the P wave, which means atrial depolarization. All right. And then you have that PR interval. You have atrial systole. And then you have ventricular depolarization, ventricular systole. And then you have ventricular repolarization. So whenever you don't have this set up, guys, whenever you don't see this, please believe that this patient is going to have some type of cardiac output issues. The cardiac output will decrease. And that's the problem. All right, our body is very specialized. So these electrolytes like hypokalemia, that's going to give the patient. Now follow follow me while while I'm saying this. Hypokalemia. The patient is going to have ST depression. Look at ST depression. ST depression. Okay? This patient is going to have a shallow T wave and a prominent U wave. You see? Shallow. This patient is going to have ST depression. Look at the ST. Look at ventricular systole. A shallow T wave and a prominent U wave. So this is going to affect the patient's cardiac output, guys. So that's a problem. So as a nurse, we have to let someone know right away. All right? So again, let's look at a normal sinus rhythm, okay? A normal sinus rhythm. This is what we want everyone. We want everyone to have a normal sinus rhythm. So the heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular. There's a P wave before each QRS. And the PR interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And the QRS is less than 0.12 seconds. Beautiful. There's no issues with cardiac output there. Okay. There can't possibly be any electrolyte imbalances or any type of disturbances. And if so, they haven't affected the electrical conduction of the heart. So this is what we want. But when we have issues such as hyperkalemia, when we're dealing with things like hyperkalemia, look at, look at how it looks. Look at those peak T waves, okay? So it's, there's going to be an issue with cardiac output, okay? So whenever we have a patient who has any type of electrolyte imbalances, guys, we need to let someone know because we know that these electrolyte imbalances can affect the heart. So look, let's look at hyperkalemia. So as I said, I want you to look at a normal sinus rhythm. So if someone has hyperkalemia, they have a widened, a widened QRS. They have tall peaked T waves. They have a depressed ST segment. So let me say it again. If someone has hyperkalemia, they have a wide QRS, they have a depressed ST segment and a peaked T wave. So guys, just looking at what a normal sinus rhythm is compared to what someone will present with hyperkalemia, you know that that's going to affect the cardiac output. So I want you to keep that in mind, guys. We need to make sure we let someone know, all right? Because this is what we want. This is what we want. We know that our patients are safe. We know that the cardiac output is safe. 60 to 100 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular. The P wave before each QRS. And the PR interval, you see? 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. The QRS is less than 0 0.12 seconds. That's what we need. OK, so if our patient has an electrolyte imbalance like hypokalemia and hyperkalemia, we need to let someone know because we don't want our patients to heart start having these, um, you know, abnormal or 
these prolonged QT intervals, which will definitely affect the patient's cardiac output. So this is our patient who has hypocalcemia, all right? Hypocalcemia. This patient will have a prolonged QT interval, all right? You guys know we're very specialized. The heart is very, very specialized. And I know that there's patients walking around in all type of funky rhythms, but theoretically, guys, this is what we want. As first-year new nurses, you always want to say, I know that there's issues out in the community. I get that. But I know that hypokalemia can cause a prolonged QT interval, a prolonged QT interval. And as a new nurse, I am expected to let someone know. All right, you guys got that? As a first year nurse, guys, I know that there's people walking around with all type of dysrhythmias. But as a first year nurse, if someone has hypocalcemia, you need to make sure you alert the physician right away because this is going to cause a prolonged QT interval and this is going to decrease the patient's cardiac output. So you're going to let someone know if someone has hypocalcemia. That's a big deal because you know it affects the cardiovascular system. All right? So this is what we want. We always want our patients to be in a normal sinus rhythm. If our patient has these electrolyte imbalances, guys, we are not going to get this normal sinus rhythm, and it's going to decrease the cardiac output. This is why the patient is fainting. This is why the patient is fail, um, pale. This is why the patient has dyspnea on exertion because he's not in a normal sinus rhythm. Okay? So whenever you see hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, please make sure that you first you have to recognize the lab value is abnormal and then you need to notify someone right away. All right. So let's look at hyponatremia. This is a low sodium. All right. A low sodium. Look what hyponatremia does. It's going, the patient is going to have a wide QRS complex and an elevated ST segment. And look at the CNS changes from hyponatremia. Confusion, guys. Always remember hyponatremia. Remember confusion. That, that patient is going to be loose as a goose. Okay? Confusion. Restlessness. Restlessness. Somnolence. Somnolence is like when you have a... I don't know if you've ever had someone around you that was very, very inebriated, like drinking a lot. And you know when you shake them, you know that they are alive because they're going to say, what, what, what? And then they're going to go back to sleep. You know, you shake them, what, what, what? They're going to go back to sleep. Somnolent. That's how your patient is going to present. That's not good. Okay? Nausea, your patient is going to have seizures and a coma. Can possibly have a seizure and a coma. But look at his ECG. Okay? Look at a wide QRS complex, an elevated ST segment. This patient could start having, this patient can go into ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, guys, for hyponatremia. So that's why as a nurse, as a first year nurse, I'm, listen, if you, if your lab values are not within normal limits with me, I'm going to call the physician because I know that you are at risk for any of these dysrhythmias, okay? And the board wants you to understand that. So you have hyponatremia here. This patient is going to have wide QRS complexes. And follow me. This patient is going to have a wide QRS complex and an elevated ST segment. So you and I both know that this patient's cardiac output will be decreased which is why, maybe, why the patient is fainting, why the patient has dyspnea on exertion, okay? This is probably why the patient is, full, is, is pale. We want our patients to have this. Heart rate 60 to 100, regular rhythm, P wave before each QRS, PR interval 0.12 to 0.20, and a QRS less than 0.12 seconds. But with hyponatremia, guys, 
Look at the QRS complex, because I know you know where it is now. The QRS complex is going to be wide, and the ST segment is going to be elevated. Okay, and you guys know that when this occurs, the cardiac output for this patient will decrease and I need to let somebody know right away that this patient has an abnormal lab value because these lab values, guys, these electrolytes could have effects on the, on the heart. All right, to be continued, we have phosphorus here. Phosphorus, guys. And who thinks of phosphorus as a big deal? But it is. It's an electrolyte, and it can have an issue. It can cause issues for the heart. You have mag. Now, I want you to really... If, if you don't, well, I'm not going to say that, but I really want you to understand mag. You must know how devastating magnesium could, can be. Low levels can cause ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation, guys. And a high level causes muscle weakness, hypotension, bradycardia. For a high level, I want you to write down deep tendon reflex. Deep tendon reflex for high level of magnesium. Deep tendon reflexes. Deep tendon reflexes. If I have a patient who has a, a high mag, guys, then he's not good. The, the, the deep tendon reflex is absent. Absent deep tendon reflexes. This patient is going to be very weak. This patient is going to be uh, hypotensive, a low blood pressure, guys and the heart rate. So essentially, a nurse is running mag. She's not watching the magnesium. She's giving this patient magnesium and not watching the patient. Maybe she forgot about the magnesium was running and the patient is dying. The patient, the deep tendon reflexes are completely gone. If you ever have a patient, guys, and you are giving magnesium and the deep tendon reflex is absent, you need to stop that mag. Yes, because they give a patient who has preeclampsia magnesium to calm everything down. But you still have to monitor the mag, Deborah. It doesn't negate the fact that magnesium can kill you. Magnesium can stop your heart. The dysrhythmia is bradycardia. So the patient will be at a 60 then the patient will be at a 50, and then the patient will be at a 40 heart rate, and then the 30 heart rate, and absent deep tendon reflexes. So I want you guys to remember high levels can cause muscle weakness, hypotension, bradycardia. It's a depressant. It's going to depress the muscles. The heart is a muscle. Okay, so we're going to do FOSS. Phos can af affect the heart. Phosphorus can affect the heart, of course. Magnesium can affect the heart, of course. Look at low levels. It's a stimulant, VTAC, VFib. A low level is a stimulant, okay? Mm-hmm. Yes, a low level is a stimulant. Magnesium can do some damage, guys. So you don't want to play around with magnesium, all right? You want to monitor magnesium. Monitor it like you will monitor morphine because I know everyone is, af is afraid of morphine, all right? Blood, urea, nitrogen. Guess what? The BUN is also elevated in heart disorders, the BUN. And the blood glucose, the sugar, guess what? Acute cardiac episode can elevate levels. Guys, when a person is under stress, the glucose will increase. So we have our phosphorus here, we have our mag here, the BUN is elevated in heart disorders, and the glucose. That's why that patient that has never taken insulin before is on insulin now. Never taken insulin. It's not a diabetic, but the patient is under stress. Blood glucose is very high. So let's do it. Let's do our visuals. Hypophos, guys, I want you to remember it can do damage to the heart. So we're going to focus on cardiac. It can cause dysrhythmias. Hypophos can cause dysrhythmias. And this is why if it is abnormal, let the physician know. As a first year nurse, don't allow anyone to tell you that, oh, you don't have to call because of an electrolyte. Yes, you do. You're a first year nurse. You need to call because you're safe. You're a safe first year nurse. 
and you know that phosphorus can cause dysrhythmias. So you're gonna call for any level that's not within normal limits because a first year nurse has to call and let someone know because remember, you've only been on the floor for one year. All right, ventricular tachycardia, hypomagnesium. So hypomag, all right? When someone has a low mag level, guess what? Ventricular tachycardia. Where is your PQRS T? Where is your atrial depolarization? Where is your atrial systole? Where is your ventricular depolarization? Where is your ventricular systole? Where is your ventricular repolarization? So you guys know that this patient cardiac output has decreased. And this is how, this is what can happen if someone has a low magnesium, okay? Remember, if someone has a low magnesium, they can go into ventricular tachycardia. And that's why you're calling the doctor as a first year nurse. I'm calling somebody. Now look at ventricular fibrillation, hypomag. Look what happens. Where is the, where is the atrial depolarization? Where is the atrial systole? Where is the ventricular depolarization? Where is the ventricular systole? Where is the ventricular repolarization? So you guys know that hypomag could cause a patient to go into V-fib. So that's why if the level is abnormal, you are calling the physician right away. Okay? You are calling the physician right away because you know that electrolytes could affect the heart. That's why you're calling. All right. So now you have hypermag. This patient has too much magnesium. All right. Too, so now this patient has a widened QRS complex. Remember, the QRS complex is specialized. All right. So let's start from the beginning. P wave is flat, prolonged PR interval, a widened QRS complex a tall T wave. So we know that this is not what we need to see as a new nurse. Okay, there you go. D fib with B fib. All right. You guys know that this is not what we want to see as a new nurse. So we are going to let someone know. I probably would endeavor, I would ask the physician to let me know when it comes to that. Because that's somewhat like rescue medications. So when someone has these, um, when the, someone are in, when they're having these funky dysrhythmias, Deborah, make sure you call a cold and don't start pushing these um, rescue medications unless there's an ED doctor there to guide you, okay? Because let me tell you something, Deborah. I've I've been ACLS certified for quite some time and I would not run a cold. Now I've seen nurses that can run a cold, no doubt, but it's intense. Okay. So be careful, but I, I see where you're getting at. Mm -hmm. I see exactly where you're getting at, but you got to be very careful with that, Deborah. Very, very careful. Okay. Very careful. Let the physician tell you what to push. Don't just go into a room and, and do these things. Okay. Be very, very careful with that, Deborah. Because we just see the VTAC, it may be something else going on there, okay? So be careful with that. Don't run into anybody's room and start pushing anything. Call a cold, all right? But I know exactly what you're getting. I know what you're getting at. Yeah, I know what you're getting. You're trying to calm the heart down. I know what you're trying. I know what you're, I know what you're speaking of. All right, so elevated in heart disorders. I want you to remember the BUN, okay? I want you to remember the B one is elevated in heart disorders. So the kidneys, guys, you know, the heart and the kidneys, they're together. They're going to be together. So make sure that you understand that the heart, the, the B one, these levels may be elevated if someone is having some type of heart disorder. So don't feel, um, you know, like it's out of place. It should be there. And take a look at the blood glucose. Okay. The blood glucose, acute cardiac episode can ele elevate levels. So you may have a patient whose blood glucose is very high because of stress, all right? The, the cardiac, the, whenever there's a, any type of cardiac episode, guys, the blood glucose is going to increase. 
So just take a look at, you know, the excessive blood glucose. So this may be why the physician ordered insulin and this patient isn't a diabetic because that, Deborah, I have seen. All right. I've seen that, Miss Miss Amy. I have seen patients who are not diabetic and they're on the insulin because they know that under stress, a patient's blood glucose can elevate. All right. So diagnostic procedures continue. Remember, we're doing a cardiac workup here. This guy has good insurance. So we're trying to figure out what's going on with this patient. We've looked at the urine for albumin. We have looked at uh, the lipids. We know if this patient cholesterol is high, total cholesterol, HDL, LDL. We've looked at the urine. We've looked at the electrolytes, right? We looked at uh, the potassium, the magnesium, the calcium, the sodium, the phosphorus. We've looked at the kidneys, the BUN, right? the patient presents with some type of edema or if they're trying to rule out heart failure, they'll do the BMP. All right. They're going to do the BMP. It's released in response to atrial and ventricular stretch. So I want you guys to, we saw so many um, rhythms today. Um, you know, look, close your eyes and visualize this patient having BMP is released in response to atrial stretch and ventricular stretch. All right. And I want you guys to remember this. Don't ever forget this. This serves as a marker for heart failure. So if you have a patient who's diagnosed with heart failure, I want you to make sure that you're asking, what is the BMP? What's the BMP level? What's the BMP level? This is the definitive this is the marker for heart failure, guys. You don't have a patient in heart failure, and you as a nurse don't know the BMP level, okay? Of course, they'll do a chest X, right? This patient is doing a cardiac workup. This patient has some good insurance. So they're going to do a chest X-ray, and they're going to do an electrocardiography. Uh, what is that? A good old EKG, or some say ECG, but EKG, ECG, same thing. So the BMP for heart failure, they're going to do the chest X-ray because they can look at the silhouette of the heart. They can see the position of the heart. They can actually see the size of the heart. And, you know, the ECG, the ECG does a lot. So this is very important, guys. Very, very important. All right. As for you guys, for a new nurse. Now, I can tell you this. I looked at the 2019 test plan. My best friend in the entire world is the 2019 test plan because I wanted to make sure that I'm giving you information that you're going to be tested on as a new new nurse. So this is what they say about the ECG. They want you to be able to take care of a patient who has telemetry, who is on the telemetry monitor. All right. So you must know this ECG. Okay. You must know it. Okay. On the 2019 test plan, it says the care of a patient on telemetry. So ECG, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to, that'll be it for us. All right. So electrocardiography records electrical activity of the heart, right? The electrocardiography is useful for detecting cardiac dysrhythmias. That's you. All right. You have to know your cardiac dysrhythmias the location and extent of an MI, cardiac hypertrophy, and guys, the effectiveness of a cardiac medication. So when someone is in a cold, guys, they'll have the patient attached to a monitor, a heart mag, or a lidocaine, or atropine. They want to know if it's working. And they can determine that it's working based off the ECG. So let's go. BMP. Remember, this is this gives the uh, signals. This is a signal. This is for heart failure. All right. This is a lab for heart failure. So remember, BMP, remember wall stress. All right. This is the stretching. All right. Of the. Remember the atrium and the ventricles. All right. It's stretching. So just remember wall stress, guys, wall stress, the BMP. 
And I put it here so many times so you'll see BMP, BMP, BMP. This is a, this is like a little, a graph or what do they call it? A protocol. There's another name for it. But this kind of gives you an idea of what would you have to do if you have a patient who has heart failure. So look how many times BMP is here. Remember, wall stress, wall stress, BMP, wall stress. This is somebody has heart failure. All right. So BMP, hormone secreted by cardiomyocytes, the cells of the, of the heart, and heart ventricles in response to stretching caused by increased ventricular blood volume. Remember, the patient has heart failure, so of course he has increased ventricular blood volume. So this is a hormone secreted by cardiomyocytes in the heart ventricles in response to stretching caused by increased ventricular blood volume. Remember, the patient has heart failure. Of course, he has increased ventricular blood volume. That's why we're giving him the digoxin because we're trying to get it out. Okay. Of course, the patient does. All right. They're going to do a chest x-ray because remember, this guy has insurance. So we're going to do a complete cardiac workup because we need to need, we need to see the silhouette of the heart. We need to see the size of the heart. Okay, we need to see the position of the heart. So they're going to order a chest X-ray. And of course, they're going to do a cardiac muscle and electrical activity. They're going to do an EKG, guys, a good old EKG. And remember that PQRS complex ST segment T wave, U wave, we want it to be perfect for all of our patients because we know when there's any type of abnormality that our patient's cardiac output will decrease. And that's a problem for us. All right. As nurses, because I have to make sure I'm keeping this guy safe for the 12 hours that I'm with him. So if this electrical ac activity isn't occurring the way that it should, look at the P. I put another a little visualization here for you guys. It starts here. Start is at number one. Then it goes to number two. Then it goes to number three. So take a look at this, guys. Um, down, make sure you download this PowerPoint because it tells you the different parts of the ECG as the heart is pumping. So I think it's very cool. So make sure that you download these PowerPoint slides, guys, so you can see the atrial you know, you, you can you kind of see how the, the heart works. So let me just run it through with you guys one time, just so you'll have it on record, okay? So it tells you about, it shows you, it actually shows you atrial depolarization. It shows you ventricular depolarization, okay? Mm-hmm. Because I'm a visual person too, Ms. Amy. All right? And it, it tells you the, the entire electrical activity. And if you look very closely, when you look at the PowerPoint, some of them are like purple. That's how you know what's occurring at that, per, that, that particular step. So make sure you download this, guys, okay? Make sure you download this. All right, so EKG segment. You can see this very well. EKG segment. All right, you have the P, Q, R, S, T, U. And you, you guys know that it's very specialized. So they're going to do this because they need to know if this patient is having any type of, um, any type of issues with the heart. Is the patient having, uh, you know, is, is everything occurring the way that it should? Is the patient having atrial depolarization? Is the patient having atrial systole? Ventricular depolarization, ventricular systole, ventricular repolarization. So they're going to definitely do an EKG. All right. So we always want our patients again to have our normal sinus rhythm. 
All right. We always want our normal sinus rhythm because I know that my patient is going through atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, ventricular repolarization. All right. So uh, the, the physician is definitely, if they're going to do a cardiac workup, they have to look at the electrical conductivity of the heart. All right. So this is just another visual for you guys, okay? Of course, they're going to pull an ECG because they need to know how the heart, how the electrical conduction of the heart is. Is it, is it within normal limits? Are there some dysrhythmias going on? So just take a look at these slides because I want you guys to visualize all right. I want you to be able to see it, the, a normal sinus rhythm when you're taking the test. I want you to be able to see it. All right. All right. So we have normal sinus rhythm, heart rate, rhythm, P wave, PR interval, QRS. All right. Heart rate, 60 beats a minute. But when we have sinus tack, guys, remember, the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. That can be an issue, especially if the patient is symptomatic. Okay? If the heart rate is greater than 100, it can be an issue if the patient is symptomatic. We want the heart, for sinus tech, the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute, but the rhythm is regular, the P wave. All right, the P wave is before each QRS, they're identical. The PR interval is fine. The QRS interval is fine. It's just the heart rate is greater than 100. And that can be an issue if the patient is symptomatic. Okay? So we're always, you know, is, is uh, the heart rate causing the patient to faint? Is, is this why the patient is um, having difficulty dystonia on, um, on exertion? So if the patient is symptomatic, it's a problem. Sinus Brady. Look at, look at sinus bradia, bradycardia, okay? Look at sinus bradycardia. Heart rate, less than 60 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular. The P wave before each QRS, identical. The PR interval is fine, and the QRS is fine. The issue is the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. Now, I know there's people that walk around at a 50 Beats per minute heart rate. I know that. The issue for us is, is the patient symptomatic? Because if I have a patient who is 58 and symptomatic, that's a problem for me. That's all I need to know as a first year nurse. Okay. The patient is sinus Brady and he's symptomatic. I'm calling the doctor. I'm going to keep, make sure the patient is safe. And I'm calling the doctor because something is wrong. The patient has a heart rate less than 60 and the patient is symptomatic, I need to call the doctor, okay? Because I'm a first-year nurse, and that's what I do. I need to call the doctor because maybe there's something else going on, especially if the patient is symptomatic, okay? Then I have my PACs. These are my premature atrial contractions, guys. So just take a look at it, okay? You guys should know how the PQRST should be, but there's a premature atrial contraction. Is the patient symptomatic? Okay. Sometimes a patient may have these premature atrial contractions when uh, they drink coffee or they get excited or, you know, things like that. All right. So this is the, the, the PVC versus a PAC. So these are all premature. This is a premature beat from the atrium. And this one is from the ventricles. Okay. Is the patient symptomatic? Is the patient fainting? Is the patient diaphoretic? Is there an issue? All right, because remember, if there's an issue, I need to let someone know because this is still an irregular rhythm. And as of new nurse, it's not my judgment, it's not my call. You may have a patient who has multifocal PVCs. Okay, multifocal. Look at the PQRS. You see how there's an interruption. Is the patient symptomatic? Okay. Is the patient fainting? Is the patient having difficulty breathing? All right. Multifocal PVCs. So here's an explanation for you guys. PVCs versus PACs. 
Remember, guys, either way, they're dysrhythmias. Okay, if you see them um, and if the patient is symptomatic, you need to let someone know. So PVCs versus PACs. Premature beats that start in your heart's upper chambers are premature atrial contractions. So these are PACs. Those that start in the lower chambers are premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. All right. So if, if this is causing the patient some issues, guys, you know, still you, you need to let someone know PVCs versus PACs. They're premature. So, you know, maybe something is going on. Maybe there's some type of irritation going on or just make sure that you let someone know. So this is PACs and then this is PVCs. All right. And the infamous, the must know, the must know, watch videos on this. Look at a real person video on YouTube. Find someone who's suffering from AFib. Guys, you need to know AFib front and back. You have to know AFib. When someone is in AFib, guys, you see they start throwing clots. Look where that clot is going. Type in the chat, where, where is that clot going from the heart? Where is it going to? Where is that clot going to travel to from the heart? Write it in the chat, guys. Where do you think that clot is going? Oh, yeah. So this is why, guys, we don't, we don't play around or hesitate when it comes to AFib. Because look at it. No doubt, if this patient is not on any type of blood thinners or if this patient doesn't receive any treatment, that patient is on, or that patient is at risk for that clot that you know that he's going to throw, that clot will travel to the brain. This is why, guys, we do not play around with a fib, okay? Because that irregular heart bleed, that irregular heartbeat, it's going to cause a patient to throw a clot, and that clot can travel to the brain, guys. There you go. So strokes, all right? So I want you guys to just make sure you always keep this picture in mind. When you see AFib, this is the reason why this is a big deal for a new nurse, for a new grad, guys. This is you. You need to know this, all right? You, this is, you have to know this. So as a new nurse, as a first year safe nurse, guys, this is AFib. Now we know that we need our atrial depolarization, ventricular depolarization, ventricular repolarization. We know that. Look at AFib. Do you think that process is occurring with AFib? No. Okay. It is not. So this patient cardiac output will decrease. This patient will be symptomatic. This patient will be symptomatic, guys. No doubt about that. Okay? V-fib. All right? Take a look at V-fib. Where is the atrial depolarization? Where is the atrial systole? Where is the ventricular depolarization? Where is the ventricular systole? Where is the ventricular repolarization? All right? So you guys know that the cardiac output will decrease. This patient is going to be symptomatic. All right? So V-fib, guys, when you have somebody who's in V-fib, com it's completely disorganized, and it's immediate cessation of cardiac output. Immediate cessation of cardiac output. That's the problem. That's for me and you. This is a problem. This is our patient, and he has immediate cessation of cardiac output. The cardiac output is done. No associated pulse. This patient does not have a discernible P wave. This patient does not have a discernible QRS complex or T waves. This is incompatible with life. So as a new nurse, you know that this is something that you need to report right away. So what do you do for someone who is in V-fib? You D-fib, okay? Someone who's in V-fib, guys, you D-fib, all right? That is your nursing intervention as a new nurse. If someone is in V-fib, you D-fib. As a new first-year safe nurse, D-fib. If someone has pulseless ventricular tachycardia, go 
ahead and look at this. Okay. If someone has postless ventricular tachycardia as a new nurse, as a first year safe nurse, what do you do? You defib. You defib. All right. If someone has, you know, V-fib, you defib. If someone has pulseless ventricular tachycardia, you defib as well. Okay. So make sure you remember those. You have to know that. All right. Now, this is someone who has supraventricular um, tachycardia. This is S SVT. All right. SVT. Okay. Now you can still see, you know, um, you can still kind of look at it, you know, supraventricular tachycardia versus sinus rhythm. This patient heart, this patient's heart rate is very, very high. So the cardiac output has definitely decreased, guys, with SVT. Okay, <laughs> it has definitely decreased. I had a, a visual there for you, but I had to take it off because of copyright. But just know that SVT is a lethal rhythm as well. All right. Cardiac output will decrease as well. All right. And then just another visual of pulseless ventricular tachycardia, guys. Make sure for a pulseless ventricular tachycardia, you defib. And pulseless electrical activity. Pulseless electrical activity. All right. Normally, what causes what puts someone into postless electrical activity, guys, is a, a development of a cardiac tamponade. Maybe the patient may have a, a tension pneumothorax, mechanical hy hyperinflation, pulmonary embolism. So, when you have a patient who has a postless electrical activity, so postless, no pulse, but the electrical activity is, sh is still showing on the monitor, um, it's usually the patient has a cardiac tamponade. Tension pneumothorax, mechanical hyperinflation, or pulmonary embolism. So that's the main reason why you always want to do your rounds because some patients may be in cardiac tamponade, won't have a pulse, but the monitor is showing electrical activity. So you always want to treat the patient, not the monitor. All right, so the big deal here, all right, and we're almost there, guys. We're almost there with this cardiac workup, all right? We're almost there. Myocardial infarction, guys, and everyone knows what this is. They call it a heart attack, right? Myocardial infarction. So look what's happening. Look, just look, visualize the, the block in the artery. That's why this patient is having the muscle damage. Okay, look at it, the block in the ar artery. There's an actual block. You know, it's not like an electrical disturbance. There's an actual block there. And you guys know what that is, right? What is that? What's blocking the artery? What is it? What's blocking that artery? There you go, the plaque. Okay, the plaque is blocking the artery. So when we get this patient, guys, because of that plaque, okay, now you will see an ST elevation myocardial infarct. So that's what they call a STEMI, okay? You will see ST elevation myocardial infarction, all right? Mm -hmm. The plaque will cause that that blockage in that area is going to cause the PQRST will be there. But look at the ST elevation, guys. The ST, there will be ST elevation. All right. When someone has a myocardial infarct, guys, you're looking at the ST. Remember STEMI. ST elevation myocardial infarction. STEMI. ST elevation myocardial infarction. And then you have the the EKG can also determine if a patient has cardiac hypertrophy, guys. And there's different types of cardiac hypertrophy, but I wanted you guys to kind of see, you know, uh, look at the thickness of the ventricles. So that's cardiac hypertrophy. The EKG monitor can determine that too. And the ECG for our patient with this good insurance can also determine if the patient, um, if the medications, the cardiac medications are working. So they can actually pinpoint, they'll know based off the medication that they've administered, 
they'll be able to read the monitor and tell if the medication has been effective. So this is another reason that they will have an ECG there. All right. All right, guys, that is it. So I want you to join me again on Monday for, guess what, heart blocks. Okay, heart blocks, because heart blocks is a bit, you know, it's kind of tricky, but they have little uh, rhymes and rhythms that we can use. So heart blocks on Monday, okay? All right, and good night, guys, and get this PowerPoint. The PowerPoint will be in the description box. All right, you're welcome. So see you Monday, okay? Heart blocks on Monday. You're welcome, guys. See you Monday. Thanks for joining me, guys. And I'll see you um, next week. Guys, remember, you need um, for your uh, CBC, well, for your Comp B, make sure you're following that uh, test plan, the RN test plan 2019, please, and doing questions, a lot of questions. All right, guys. See you later. Good night.